Today is February 3rd, 2023. We do have a quorum present. And our uh, first bill up today is uh, restoration of voting rights. Senator Champion, uh, members and, and, uh, and members of the audience, um, we have uh, Senate File 26 uh, here, but we also received House File 28 last night um, on the referral from the other body. So what we're going to do um, is we're going to amend the Senate language into the House file uh, frame so that it will move forward from here under the House file number, but with our Senate language. Um, there's almost no difference, but that's uh, the easiest way for us to proceed. So uh, Senator Pappas moves uh, to do just that. Is that correct, Senator Pappas? All right. Uh, any discussion on that motion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails, amendments adopted. All right, we have Senator Champion here to make a presentation on uh, his bill, and he has some witnesses to, uh, or testifiers with him as well. Uh, so Senator Champion. Mr. Chair and committee, thank you so very much for waking up this morning and uh, coming over on a cold morning in order to hear this important piece of policy. And I thank you in advance for all the great work that you do. Senate File 26, to me, is affectionately and appropriately known as Restore the Vote. Uh, passage of this bill will allow more than 50,000 individuals from across the great state of Minnesota to vote. That's more than 50,000 individuals who are on felony probation, living in our communities, raising children, paying taxes, but denied the right to participate in our democracy. When I say that these individuals are from across the state, I really mean it as only 30, 36% come from Hennepin and Ramsey County and about 64%, but some say as high as 70% come from outstate, rural, suburbia, suburbia, or greater Minnesota. Minnesota has a history of sentencing individuals to long probationary terms. Unfortunately, Minnesota statute section 609.165 prohibits a person on felony probation from voting. Ironically, a bad decision that led to the person's felony conviction doesn't involve voting, but this right to vote is taken and disenfranchises more than 50,000 individuals. And when I say individuals, I mean our neighbors, our family members, and friends. As policymakers, we have an opportunity to correct this wrong and restore the vote, the, the right to vote to individuals not incarcerated, but living among, amongst us. Lyndon Johnson said, a man without a vote is a man without protection. By voting, we add our voice to the course that forms opinions and the basis for action. And there's no such thing as a vote that doesn't matter. When, uh, uh, well, I think, uh, Mr. Chair and committee members, we all can agree on the importance of voting as a tool in our democracy. If we can all agree that individuals on, on felony probation involved in pro-social activities lead to positive outcomes in our society, not to mention when children see and experience their parents voting, and they grow seeing and understanding the importance of voting, those children largely become voters. So I can think in terms of all the important notions that restoring this right to vote brings. And so today, you will hear from a cross-section of Minnesotans from various walks of life asking you to restore the right to vote to our fellow Minnesotans. You'll hear from my good friend, uh, Attorney General Ellison and Commissioner Snell from the Department of Corrections. You'll hear later from uh, Secretary of State Steve Simon. Uh, also, we have John Choi from the Ramsey County Attorney's Office, and I see my good friend, former uh, Judge Smalls, also in, in the audience. You'll hear from Shane Price and others. I could go on. And you'll also hear from Mincasa, who represents victims. That's important because we've heard people say, well, what about victims? They're represented here today. And you ha you'll also hear from J George Gibson, and he'll talk about his Republican credentials, but also the great work that he does with veterans and other felons as well. 
and Taylor Jones, not, and, 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 and we'll go through those. But the whole reason for me articulating that with clarity is because I want you to see that we have a cross section of Minnesotans that are in this room, and some who will not testify. But their presence speaks volumes as it pertains to the importance that they place on this moment. And with that in mind, Mr. Chair, if um, I'd be happy to call on our first testifier, which would be my good friend, Attorney General Keith Ellison. Thank you, Senator Champion and Attorney General Ellison. Welcome back to the Judiciary Committee. It's nice to have you here. Thank Please you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you to all members, and certainly thank you to the bill author, uh, Senator Bobby Champion. Um, uh, 20 years ago, just about 20 years ago, uh, I actually introduced a piece of legislation very similar to this when I was a member of the state legislature. Uh, and Senator uh, Linda Higgins, uh, who is your predecessor, <laughs> Mr. Mr. Senator Champion, introduced it in the Senate. And uh, we actually uh, passed it through committee. Representative Jim Rhodes, uh, a very honorable, wonderful representative, Republican member from St. Louis Park, uh, was the chair of the committee. And the bill passed and was on the general register. And it was passed on a bipartisan basis. And, the, and in all candor, it was opposed by some on a bipartisan basis, too. The bottom line is our thinking has evolved. And I think we're at a moment where we can all agree that uh, uh, redemption is important, uh, including people in society is important. Uh, and so today I hope that you will pass this legislation. Let me no, move to my second point, which is this is pro-social legislation. I'm a prosecutor. Uh, we prosecute people who can violate the law and commit crimes, but not one single prosecutor or police officer I've ever met wants a repeat business. <laughs> we want people to learn from their mistakes and remain law-abiding. And one way to do that is for people to uh, be involved in and have a stake in society and voting helps advance that. I have said far from denying people the right to vote when they're on probation and parole, we should mandate it mm -hmm. uh, because it will then give people a reason to be involved and committed to society. Last point, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, is that the ACLU, when uh, after I became the Attorney General, filed a lawsuit to invalidate the current law which says that you cannot vote if you're on probation or parole on the grounds that it has racially discriminatory effects. Uh, and uh, under my duty to defend doctrine as attorney general, we oppose the law because we believe, even though I personally believe the policy is wrong under current law, as attorney general, I have a responsibility to defend Minnesota law as it exists. That's part of what it means to be the attorney general. Uh, but I would say to you that our position is not, it, our position is very simple. It is that it is the prerogative of the legislature to pass, to change the law. And that's what we're doing right here, right now. And so I would simply submit to you that, uh, that it is within the boundaries of the Constitution for the Minnesota State Legislature to change current law and to allow people to vote when they, uh, get out of confinement. In fact, this would not be a radical or nation leading position. Maine and Vermont never take away a person's right to vote. In fact, we would just join a fairly large number of states uh, that have the policy that Senator Champion's uh, legislation proposes. Uh, and uh, what we would be doing by that is expanding democracy, which I think is a beautiful thing. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney General Ellison. Senator Champion, you want to introduce your next testifier? Next, my next uh, a testifier is uh, the Commissioner of the Department of Corrections, Commissioner Schnell. Commissioner thank, Schnell, welcome. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, members, and Senator Champion. Uh, my name is Paul Schnell. I serve as Commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Corrections, and I'm here to speak in support of Senate File 26. John Braithwaite, is an Australian criminologist. Braithwaite flipped the traditional criminological question of why do people commit wrongdoing and instead asked the question, why do most people do the right thing most of the time? Now you may wonder, what does this have to do with voting rights? And I promise I'll get there. But Braithwaite's answer to the question came from historical observations of tribal communities where strong connections among and between community members resulted in reduced levels of wrongdoing. 
But over time, the more dispersed and disconnected tribal members and families became, pro-social engagement reduced in many cases and levels of wrongdoing began to increase. Braithwaite's central hypothesis for the reason we as people mostly do the right thing most of the time is because we want to maintain engagement and positive connections with people around us. The lesson from Braithwaite's question and decades of research is that if you want safer communities, increase positive community engagement and connection. The point as it relates to this bill is that voting in a democracy is tantamount to the opportunity for full engagement and community connection. Voter disenfranchisement is the antithesis of full engagement and participation. It's ironic that some believe voter disenfranchisement somehow serves the state's penological or public safety interests. But here's why voter disenfranchisement proposition makes no sense. I'll provide a few examples. Being on felony probation, supervision, or on supervised release does not preclude a person from running for an elected role in the PTA at their child's school. In fact, we would regard that kind of engagement as a positive and pro-social indicator. A person on felony probation or supervision or supervised release can walk the halls of the state capitol, this very Senate building, or the state office building to engage with public officials and share their thoughts about the state budget on, or any public policy. In fact, we would regard that kind of engagement as a positive and pro-social indicator. A person on felony probation or supervised release can attend a city council or township board meeting anywhere in our state and have the opportunity during the public comment portion of that meeting to address the elected officials with their opinion about a proposed business development or the need for a stop sign at an uncontrolled intersection. And we would regard that kind of engagement as positive and pro-social engagement. A person on felony probation or supervised release can write a letter and have published that letter to the editor at a, of a local newspaper to educate and encourage voters about a particular candidate or illuminate voters on an important in issues. And we would regard that kind of engagement demonstrated in this and all the examples I described as positive indicators. A person on felony probation and supervised release can do all these things that we regard as positive pro-social indicators, but for some reason we believe that those on felony probation or supervised release should not be entrusted to cast a vote in our elections. One of the things we regard as good, as a positive indicator of pro-social community engagement. Mr. Chair, members, I end where I started with John Bracewhite's question, why do most people do the right thing most of the time? The answer, he would say, is not rocket science. It's positive connections and engagement with others. Voting at its core is an important feature of pro-social community engagement. We should have more of that, not less. I th thank you for allowing me to share my perspective, and I encourage your support of Senate File 26. Thank you, Commissioner Snell. Thank you. Uh, Senator Champion, would you like to uh, go down your list? Yes, All yes, right. sir. Uh, I'll now call uh, uh, John Choi, who is the county attorney from uh, Ramsey County, but he's also uh, representing the County Attorneys Association. George Gibson, who's going to join me. He's the executive director of RENET. And, and I mentioned earlier the work that he does with veterans and, 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 and felons and others. Uh, so if they can go in that order, Mr. Yes. Chair, that would be great. Thank you. County Attorney Choi, welcome to the committee. Thank you, uh, Chair Latz and members of the committee. Uh, first of all, I want to begin by uh, thanking Senator Champion for his uh, steadfast leadership in bringing this bill forward. Um, I am here today, as Senator Champion said, uh, not only as the Ramsey County Attorney, but want to make it very clear that I'm here to represent uh, all 87 elected county attorneys. The Minnesota County Attorneys Association exists to improve the quality of justice in the state of Minnesota and to represent the interests of all 87 uh, county attorneys in our state. And it was about 10 years ago when the County Attorneys Association took a position in favor of this bill. At that time, 
um, one of the, the big issues that we were faced with was um, uh, we were coming off of the Franken recount. Uh, Senator Coleman and Al Franken had a very tight race in 2008. And at that time, there was a law that required all county attorneys uh, and law enforcement to investigate all allegations of voter fraud. And so we got besieged with all of these uh, cases that we had to uh, review and take a look at. And what we found was is that there was a lot of confusion in the law, that oftentimes people on probation or parole, it was very confusing to them whether or not their civil rights had been restored. And we had a conversation within our County Attorneys Association talking about some of the challenges that we saw for our constituents who were just trying to do the right thing. They wanted to participate in our democracy. And as a part of that conversation, we recognized that the state of North Dakota had the exact same constitutional provisions about voting in, as Minnesota, but yet they did something different than what we did. They allowed people to vote who were on probation or parole, and they had a very bright line rule that just said, if you are not incarcerated, you can vote. And after that, learning more about that issue, the County Attorneys Association, about a decade ago, voted to support this change because we felt that it would lead to better outcomes. And of course, it's been said before, but anything that we can do to encourage pro-social behavior, I think has a very strong connection to getting people on the right track, being crime-free and living productive lives. And that's one of the main reasons why the County Attorneys Association is very supportive of this bill because we think actually it relates to uh, the, the safety of all of us and making sure that people are living crime-free free lives because if you are participating in your democracy, you are doing something absolutely good. So on behalf of the, uh, all of my elected colleagues in the state of Minnesota who serve as county attorneys who have to enforce uh, the voter fraud laws, uh, we encourage you to pass this bill because it is truly the right thing to do and it will make our community and state better. So thank you very much. Thank you, County Attorney Choi. Uh, George Gibson, yes, welcome. Thank you. thank you, Chair, and thank you, Committee, for uh, letting me testify on this important bill. Yeah. It's an important bill. Go ahead, bill. And, I'm sorry, go ahead and state your name oh, so we have it uh, orally George, for the record. George Gibson, and it's G-I-P-S-O-N, so thank you. Go ahead. So this is a, an important bill for me. Um, I, I'm a veteran. I served my country for a little less than 10 years. I've also um, was incarcerated for almost 10 years of my life. And so those are a kind of a different kind of dichotomy. But I, uh, I truly think that when a person has done their time, it used to be when this bill, this law was probably enacted, a lot of times it was pretty clear. You did your crime. They opened up the gate. They let you out. Um, they, they gave you whatever was in your pocket and, you're, and you were done. Um, today's legislation, the way in which we enact different things, there's a lot of long-term probationary periods. For me, um, I came out of uh, federal prison in 2007. Um, I've been down at this house and the other one, the, the people's house is important to me to have a voice. Um, yet, I could come in, I could start my company, I could run a nonprofit. I've done a lot of different things uh, since I've, uh, post my incarceration. But one of the things that withheld my pro-social support was my ability to vote. Um, I would drive up with a big truck with a gas tank full of taxes paid. Um, I would pay my taxes, yet I couldn't come in and cast a vote. Uh, for me, that was almost a constitutional issue, more so than just a, a legislative issue just because of my, my supervision while in the state. So restoring the vote to me gives me the opportunity to have my voice count. It gives me the opportunity for those that are, are in the community that are trying to be uh, good citizens to be returning citizens and not just cut off from being a citizen. Oftentimes, we do those long probationary periods. I have a friend of mine that when he was 18 took a, 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 a and said, you know what, I'll sign the, the dotted line so I don't go to jail, and took a 30-year probationary period mm -hmm. because it was offered to him. Well, at 18, 
he didn't care about whether he was going to be able to go to his school board for his kids. He wasn't even married. He didn't care about the community. But his lifestyle began to change. And as it began to change, he wanted to be able to have a voice in, in his school board issues, in his state issues. And I think restoring the vote is one of those things that is, that is built about around our democracy, that we should be able to have a vote. If I can show up whether ID cards, no ID cards, whatever the rules are, and I'm paying my taxes, I should be able to have a vote. And when we look at the release from being incarcerated to community corrections, if you want to look at that, that while I'm on community supervision, that is part of my sentencing, it's part of my, my punishment for the crime, and not part of the restoration back as a returning citizen, then fine then we should probably introduce a legislation. So maybe I didn't have to pay my taxes while I was on uh, my probationary period. That would be fine with most of us that have gone through that piece. But since I am out, I want to be a part of my society. I want to come and meet with you. I've met with many of you in offices on different bills. I am a Republican. I'm a licensed pastor. I stand for family values. It's what I believe in. Um, but this is just one of those things that is right. And from a Republican standpoint, this is a fiscal responsible bill, meaning that it's not going to cost anything out of the budget to enact it. It's actually going to save you some money, as you've just witnessed um, from uh, the other testifier, that they're not going to have to go through a bunch of verification to try and figure out whether this person could vote or couldn't vote. It's a matter of principle to be able to say, I'm paying my taxes, I should be able to vote, I should be able to come into this house. I was coming into this house from 2007 to almost 2011 without even being able to vote for anyone that, that I was speaking with, which to me was an atrocity for me. So I want to encourage you to do the next right thing. Um, it's what I tell all the men that I work with and, and talk with. I'll be going back to prison this week. Um, and I'll speak to another 130 men that, that look like me, talk like me, walk like me, that want to engage society when they come out because they're hungry to be successful. And so that's what I build in the men and women that I get to speak with. All of our clients, I've helped thousands and thousands of men and women coming out to find employment, um, helping them to have good services. And so this is just a way of reenacting and giving good so pro-social support and it doesn't cost a dime off anybody's thing except for making some changes in, in some rule books. But it's not going to change the budget line. As a matter of fact, it would actually lessen it. So I want to encourage you to vote for this bill. I want to encourage you to do the next right thing and, uh, and do the right thing as, as legislators to, for those that have been disenfranchised, like me. And so I appreciate your time. Thank you for allowing me to testify. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Gibson. Senator Champion, your next testify. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you, and I thank you, uh, I thank Mr. Gibson and, and the others, especially with, with Mr. Gibson being a Republican and coming forward and talking about his experience and what he's done, done and why this is important, not just to him, but to the others that he serve as well. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I have with me Shane Price, who's the co-founder of the Power of People Leadership Institute. Uh, and then I'm going to also ask Willie Lloyd, who's the founder of Rare Action, to come up and join us. So if they could go in that order, Mr. Chair, that would be great. Mr. Price, welcome Good. to the committee. Go ahead and state your name for the record. Then Good morning, soon. Mr. Chair. Brother Shane Price, Power of People, Personal Development and Leadership Institute. That's a very long name. We do three things. We do prevention and intervention for girls. We do prevention and intervention for boys. Uh, we work with men who are incarcerated. I have been serving uh, men who are incarcerated. That's my area, reentry. Uh, for the last 17 years, I spent four days a week, every week, for 17 years, providing personal development and leadership training inside of Minnesota State Correctional Facilities. Um, we have the most successful reentry program in recent Minnesota history. I know that because I'm African American, you might think that all of my students are African American, but that isn't true. Uh, to be honest with you, uh, when we concluded uh, just prior to COVID, 
60% uh, of all of my students were European men. But we have a, the most successful track record in recent history that there is where, where uh, ex-offenders are concerned. Some of my successful students are in this room right now, and oh, what a change it is for us to have been together in those halls of some of those institutions back there. And here we are in this beautiful institution here on Martin Luther King Drive. Uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful day for me because some of my students are right here in this room right now and prepared to speak. But I would just share this and, and be brief, uh, that to be able to add to the rehabilitation component the capacity, the civic capacity building component of vote uh, for our students would be excellent, excellent in a lot of ways because uh, some of our students would be able to see themselves as real parts of the state of Minnesota. Uh, for many years, uh, some in my community had their rights to vote suppressed, even though they were granted, but they were suppressed. I would ask the Senate uh, to be on the right side of history where this is concerned and, and take this as an opportunity to move forward the equity of voting and voting rights in the state of Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Price. And while you're there, I'm gonna ask your, your students to uh, all, if you're in the audience, go ahead and raise your hand so we can just identify you. Or, or stand up. Or stand, or stand up. up so we stand can up. see that you're here. Pop that. It's wonderful. Thank you for being here. Appreciate your being here, thank you. Senator Champion. So next, next to me is Willie Lloyd. As I mentioned, he's the founder of Rare Action and I'm gonna ask Taylor Jones, who's from Sustainable um, uh, uh, Elements and the Minnesota Second Chance Coalition to come forward. Okay, Mr. Lloyd, go ahead and state your name and right. proceed with your testimony. Right. Good morning, my name is Willie Lloyd. <clears throat> I sit before you as someone who has been formally impacted by the criminal justice system. But like you, I've been an American my entire life. And like all Americans who learn from their mistakes, we get better. <laughs> we get better. Today, I'm the executive director of Rare Action, Restoration of American Rights and Equity. I'm a spouse, a husband. I'm a proud father of a 14-year-old daughter who one day want to become a doctor. Like some of you, I'm a house owner, a businessman, a philanthropist, a life coach, a mentor. And for the last 12 years, I've been working in the most noblest profession of all and that is of a teacher. Over 5,000 students have came through my classroom. I have directly, positively impacted the lives of 5,000 people. And I'm not worthy of a vote. 13 years, 13 years I've been paying taxes for 13 years, I have not had a say. For 13 years, I felt like a second class American as though we actually have a classification for that. 13 years of taxation with no representation. I humbly ask that you please support S. File 26 because um, it has become painfully clear that this is not a Republican issue or a Democratic issue, but an American issue. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Lloyd, for appearing and for your testimony today. So, Senator Mr. Chair, uh, as I mentioned, I have Taylor Jones, who's with the Minnesota Second Chance Coalition, and then I'll ask Sarah Florman, who is uh, with Mencasa, and victims to come forward. And if they could do their presentation in that order, Mr. Chair, that would be great. Mr. Jones, welcome to the committee. Go ahead and state Good. your name for the record. 
Good morning, Mr. Chair, and good morning, Senators. My name is Taylor Jones, and I have spent uh, the last half decade working with formerly incarcerated people uh, to help them get jobs, find transportation, uh, find affordable health care, and to help them stay out of prison. Some of the people I've worked with have been innocent, most of them have been guilty, and all of them have been deserving of a right to vote for, uh, for a right to vote uh, for how their taxes will be spent, for a right to vote on the school referendums that will decide how their children uh, live their lives, uh, and for who the president is. In the committee hearings for this bill, I've heard a lot of discussions about how good or bad felons are uh, and whether they are worthy of a vote, as if this bill is a referendum on them. But this bill is a referendum on us, on whether we believe in second chances, and on whether we have the radical compassion that is necessary to truly reintegrate those who we have outcast. No matter what someone has done, they are still an American citizen with inalienable rights to vote. And yet, whether it's been slavery or poll taxes or literacy tests or grandfather clauses or felony disenfranchisements, we have always had those who would come before us with rationalizations for why this time it's different, for why this time the state has the rights to deny people the right to vote. And over time, these arguments have become more race neutral, but from where I sit, it feels like the more things have changed, the more they stay the same. Now, I recognize that there's a temptation to just say that felons need to be punished. But if we didn't live in a world that was designed to keep us from ever having to see the stigma and the isolation that formerly incarcerated people deal with, we would recognize that they've been punished more than enough. They've been sentenced to life. They're punished every day for the rest of their life. They're legally discriminated in housing, in employment, in the relation to government assistance, and in the right to vote. So I would just respectfully ask, at what point is it enough? And at what point does true justice require mercy? Thank you for this opportunity, and I just ask that you support this bill. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Uh, Ms. Florman. Welcome to the committee. Go ahead and state your name and proceed. Thank you. I'm Sarah Florman, the public policy manager at the Minnesota Coalition Against Sexual Assault, or MNCASA. MNCASA is a statewide membership coalition driving transformative culture change to address sexual violence through advocacy, prevention, racial justice, and systems change. MNCASA acts as a collective voice of organizations and individuals committed to ending sexual violence. MNCASA stands with Minnesota's anti-violence coalitions, Violence Free Minnesota, the Minnesota Indian Women's Sexual Assault Coalition, and the Minnesota Alliance on Crime in support of the Restore the Vote Act. In the same way that the Chamber of Commerce represents the statewide business community, our coalitions represent over 200 programs serving more than 68,000 victim survivors of violence annually across the state. There's been a lot of conversation about what victim survivors want. We can tell you that they have shared that the current legal system does not center their needs or prevent future harm. They're asking critical questions about what supports and interventions truly lead to safer communities. Many victim survivors of violence want initiatives, oh, sorry, want to disrupt the ongoing cycle of harm, punishment, and isolation. They want sustainable initiatives that will help build safer communities and prevent harm from happening again. They want funding for community services, safe housing, food, childcare, and avenues for healing. This legislation can help prevent future violence. The support and community engagement that folks experience upon release is critical in determining whether or not they are likely to reoffend. When people engage in civic responsibilities such as voting, they can become more connected to their communities and establish the strong support shown to impact recidivism rates. A large percentage of incarcerated people are themselves victim survivors of violence. We know that many people also experience violence while in confinement. By obstructing formerly incarcerated people's right to vote, we effectively silence these victim survivors, preventing them from fully participating in community. All victim survivors, including formerly incarcerated survivors, deserve to use their voices freely at the ballot box. Vote yes on Senate File 26 to restore their rights and support all victim survivors by investing in stronger, safer communities. Thank you, Ms. Foreman, for your testimony.
And Mr. Chair, I think Senator that, Champion. I think all the testimony has been important, but I will highlight some and underscore because I think it's important. Uh, when Ms. Floorman uh, talked about she represents an extraordinary number of victims, that's important. And she referenced that uh, when we get a person from the chamber who comes and sit down at the table and they say the number of people that they represent, we never question them and we don't say, well, what does the business owners think? We conclude that the person who's sitting at the table represents the interests of the business owners. But somehow it sometimes comes across as that when they're sitting at the table or the dais, or the testifier's table, that they're looked past. We don't want to look past victims, and we don't want to look past the work that Mencasa has done in order to gather information and then come before this wonderful body and talk about what they've heard and what they've been uh, told is in the best interest of those victims. So with that being said, Mr. Chair, we do have with us our Secretary of State, Mr. Steve Simon, and I, uh, I did let the committee know that he had another previous engagement, but he was going to be here, and I'm happy to see him here. And so, Mr. Chair, if we could hear from the Secretary of State, that would be great. Secretary Simon, uh, one of my more esteemed constituents and a mm -hmm. former colleague in the House as well, welcome to the Judiciary Committee. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's a pleasure to be before you, and particularly a chair who is my own state senator. So. Thank you very much, everyone, for being here today. And thanks for all who are here in attendance uh, behind us here today. Uh, as Secretary of State, I see as one of my top priorities investing in our democracy. Not surprising. But I think one key way to do that is by investing in our people. By most reliable estimates, there are at least 50,000 people who fall into the category right now who would be benefited by this bill. These are people who are among us, either behind me here today in the hearing room or at the grocery store you might go to over the weekend, or in any other place, a workplace, a place of leisure. And it seems to me that in our criminal justice system, if someone, a judge or a jury, after hearing all the evidence, hearing all the arguments, taking in all the factors, looking at the facts, analyzing the law, has made a determination after that methodical process that a person, for whatever reason, is safe enough, worthy enough, a good enough bet to be among the general public, then surely that person, after all those conclusions have been reached by people who know what they're talking about, who have analyzed the facts, that person is worthy enough to have a say and a stake in what happens to them. And we know, we know that people who feel as if they have a say, feel as if they have a stake, feel as if they have an investment in who governs them and how, we know that those people are far less likely to offend, which is why I say this is not an act of charity, this piece of legislation. It's not a good deed we're only doing for some other people. This is something we're doing for ourselves. It is in every single Minnesotan's interest that we foster pro-social behavior, like voting, but not limited to voting, that will make it far less likely that someone will re-offend. Historically, you look back, Mr. Chair, and at the time of the founding of Minnesota, there were fewer than 50 felonies. None of them had probationary sentences, none of them. Now we have something like 350 felonies, uh, and very few of them don't have any probationary uh, portion to the sentence. That's a real difference. Uh, perhaps it's been highlighted before, and excuse me that I just came to the hearing, but uh, the lead plaintiff in an existing lawsuit right now is someone who served a year of prison time uh, in her late 20s or very early 30s, and unless this bill passes, will not be eligible to vote until she is in her 70s. In her 70s. She's among us. She's here. She may be here in this very room. I don't know. I I'm late to this hearing. But the point is, um, that's not a result that any reasonable person can say is just. I, I just, it defies, I think, common sense and, and every sense of fairness. Now, that may be an outliner. That's probably a, a more extreme example. 
But I think in the end, it's about giving people that sense of investment after the criminal justice system, not us, not even legislators, the criminal justice system, the people who have combed over the facts and the record and applied the law after they, not us, they have determined that this person is safe enough, good enough, a clear enough bet, and worthy enough to be among us, they deserve to have that voice. And so I hope you'll give them that voice. I hope that you will join the 21 states, including North Dakota, including Iowa that's headed in that direction, Florida's headed in that direction, and others who have restored the right to vote. Thank you very much. Thank you, Secretary Simon. Appreciate your being here today. Uh, Mr. Chair. Senator Champion. <clears throat> Um, I appreciate those words because sometimes we hear whenever this bill is presented that uh, that a person's right, uh, uh, well, a person's right to vote being taken away is a part of their consequence. Uh, and even though there's been no connection between whatever infraction happened and voting. And I think the Secretary of State, Simon, did a great job of underscoring that these are people that are, that are here with us. And then the second thing that we sometimes hear is that people say, well, we should just, you know, lower the number of years that people are on probation and that's the answer. I say to that point that we can walk and chew gum at the same time. Yes, cut down the number of years that people are on probation and still give them the right to vote if they're not incarcerated. It's not a one or the other. We can do both. So with that being said, M Mr. Chair, we have uh, Jay Lindgren, who is with Isaiah, because we have a cross-section of faith leaders who um, are supportive of this bill. And I would be remiss if I didn't recognize Alfred Babington Johnson, who, who represents His Works United, which is an ecumenical group of pastors from all over this wonderful state. And so it's good to see him here. But now we'll turn to Mr. Lindgren. Uh, who's with Isaiah and Faith in Minnesota, and we choose us. Uh, so I, I, I do want to also recognize Reverend Babington Johnson. Thank you for being here with us uh, today as well. Uh, Mr. Lindgren, another constituent of mine, it turns out. Uh, <laughs> hey, you uh, admit it. Good. Yeah, Thank you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Proudly so. Welcome to the committee. Go ahead and state your name and proceed. Chair Latz, uh, Vice Chair Homo Verbeaten, and uh, lead, lead uh, Republican, <laughs> Senator La uh, Lemmer. Uh, and other distinguished members of this committee. I want to thank you for this opportunity. My name is Jay Lindgren. I live in St. Louis Park. As has been said, I'm a volunteer leader with Faith in Minnesota, and we choose us. I come to you today in support of this bill, obviously. I strongly urge you to restore the vote for the convicted persons who are our neighbors, your neighbors and my neighbors. I have voted in every election since I became eligible 58 years ago. It's became one of my good habits. Good habits and bad habits start early. I spent 50 years working in corrections in Texas, Minnesota, and Rhode Island. That experience taught me that individuals who commit so-called street crimes believe they have little stake in civil society, and our country has little investment in their lives. This enfranchisement only amplifies that belief. Each of us have good habits and bad habits. I want voting to become every citizen's good habit. Bad habits in the form of addiction to drugs or alcohol or criminal acts can be difficult to break. We have known for decades that the younger an individual is when he or she commits that first crime, the greater risk of a second crime. An early habit forms and lasts. That is why I think that there's such great symmetry between this bill and House File 110. That bill allows pre-registration of 16 and 17 year old youth, and it will promote the development of a good habit of voting beginning at age 18. Two bills that promote that good habit of voting will strengthen our democracy and help reduce recidivism. Thank you for listening, and I respectfully beseech you to pass this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lindgren. Senator Champion. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, thank you so much. There's one other person that I'd like to make sure that they have an opportunity to come forward, and I did initially have him on my list. Um, that would be Pastor Brian Heron, uh, who can speak directly to this issue. Uh, he's been doing a lot of great work in the community and with just community as a whole. So if he could come and give a couple 
uh, words, uh, Mr. Chair, that would be great. Brian Heron, who's the proud pastor of Zion Missionary Baptist Church, and then he can tell you of all the other things that he does. Amen. Pastor Heron, thank you and welcome to the committee. Go ahead and state your name and proceed. Pastor Brian Heron, I um, want to thank you, brother, uh, for all you continue to do for our community. And I want to thank the chair and this committee. Um, one of the most hurtful things to me besides uh, the incarceration itself was coming out and not being able to participate in a process that I invested my life in. We're not coming here as beggars or asking for a kindness. We're hoping you will live up to the Constitution you say that you believe in. You cannot have somebody pay their debt to society and then continue to have a continuum of punishment once they paid that debt. This law is rooted in an antiquated uh, law called civic death. And it is no longer and should have never been enacted in the first place. It causes disenfranchisement and it is dehumanizing. For a system to be just, it must believe in redemption. And it must not only believe in redemption, but practice, have redemptive practices. Believing that people can actually change their station, change the way they have behaved, and, and, and do something different and move in a different direction. And those of us who work with these men and women coming out of incarceration, we see it every day. We see it while they're inside, and we see the hope that they have that it will be accepted when they come out. So I'm asking you today to pass this because it is the right thing to do. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Pastor Heron. And we have Senator one Chandler. last testifier, Case Swanson. Uh, Ms. Swanson, welcome to the committee. Go ahead and state your full name and proceed. Kay Swanson. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here on this cold day. I live in Maple Grove in District 37, and I'm a member of Advent Lutheran Church, and I'm speaking in favor of Senate uh, File 26. Prisoners have paid their dues by serving time in a correctional institution. And unless you know someone personally that has been incarcerated, you are oblivious to the damage it does to them. It is key for a felon's reentry into society to be treated as a human being and given back privileges that they have lost. As a faith leader, I believe that our commandment is to love one another. I believe that there are those that have made wrong choices or have been accused unfairly and deserve the benefit of being treated with equality and respect after incarceration. Without privileges, felons continue to be caught in a cycle of invisibility and judgment. I became passionate about felony rights after my brother spent three years in prison. I studied the justice system and the degrading position it places people in. They become a forgotten people. No one cares. No one knows. I wanted my faith community to be aware of these issues, and we have. Advent has hosted conversations in our church along with other Lutheran congregations in the area. We discovered that people are very surprised to learn about the challenges surrounding felons, and they are absolutely in favor of seeing this changed. We want to see former prisoners given back their dignity and help them to be productive citizens. Just because they have made a mistake does not mean that they are no longer intelligent or have opinions. Outcomes from elections affect them just as much as they do us. Because they've been stripped of their rights, it affects their self-esteem and keeps them from moving forward. Passing this legislation, I believe, would be a way of supporting them, accepting them, and encouraging them 
by giving back their right to vote. I urge this committee to approve Senate File 26. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Swanson, for your testimony. Senator Champion. Uh, Mr. Chair, and finally, uh, if you look at the Senate file 26 or the House file, just briefly, it restores the, the right to vote. Then if you, you look in Section 3, there's duties of the Secretary of State to provide information about voting rights, uh, and that, that publication must be made available electronically to state court administrators for, dis, for distribution to judges and others. Um, you also will see, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, that it would, again, allow someone who is not incarcerated uh, uh, to vote, uh, is when we think in terms of felons. Uh, and then also, Section 6 uh, requires the correctional facilities to designate an, an official that will provide information to those who would be leaving the correctional uh, institution. Uh, and then there's some other language as to, you know, how those forms of notices should look in order to make sure that uh, there's some clarity there. And in the House file, it does provide some language uh, that if that information is needed in a different language for that to be available as well. That's the bill. Those are my uh, testifiers. You saw a cross-section of Minnesotans um, from all over because this is not just a Hennepin County issue or Ramsey County issue. I'll also have the page um, provide uh, not just a map of, of, of where our, our disenfranchised or uh, felons live, um, and you'll see that it's in every county, in every place, right? It's, it's, it's all over. It makes, a, makes it clear that this is a Minnesota as a whole issue, uh, but we, can stand up in this moment and do what is in the best interest of not just them, but their families and us, because we all benefit. We all do better when we all do better. So I will stand for any questions, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the opportunity to present this morning. Thank you, Senator Champion. Uh, I just want to make a, a couple of notes um, before we go on to uh, uh, committee discussion here. Uh, one is I want to call members' attention to letters that are in your committee packets, uh, letters of support from NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, Minnesota, from the African American Leadership Forum, from the Minnesota AFL-CIO, from the World Without Genocide Organization, uh, from the Center for Victims of Torture, from Reentry Employment Network, RENET, that was uh, Mr. Gibson's organization, uh, from R3, the Collaborative for Recovery, Reentry, and Renewal, um, and also from the Minnesota County Attorneys Association. Um, I also want to note that I proudly worked with Senator Champion over many years now, mm -hmm. trying to uh, get uh, restore the vote passed in the Senate, uh, sometimes as chief author, sometimes as co-author with mm -hmm. Senator Champion, as I am uh, now. and. Uh, um, this is part of why we come here to the Senate. And um, it's true, Mr. Chair, that you've been a stalwart and just a, a great ally around this critical issue, not just this one, but others. You're always thoughtful, and I just sincerely appreciate you and the others who are my co-authors, um, uh, Senator Marty, Senator Mann, uh, uh, you, uh, Chair Latz, and Umu Verbaden, the uh, Vice Chair. We are excited that this is her first year, but she came in with a burning desire to do uh, something and do this work that she was already doing even before she got here. So I appreciate everyone that's um, that signed on and those who didn't, uh, who wanted to sign on, but there was no space for them to sign on. So thank you so much for that as well. Uh, thank you, Senator Champion. Also note this is, has a bipartisan history as well. Uh, there were times on the Senate floor when Senator Newman uh, was trying to find a way to support. Uh, the bill and had some different versions of it, uh, but was uh, supportive in concept, and and uh, um, and uh, so the support over time has has not been limited uh, on a partisan basis. It's been a community-wide uh, support in many respects. So I want to two of the arguments that carry some of the most weight for me that I wanted to highlight. Uh, um, although I agree with everything that was already testified to, 
<clears throat> is, the, is a point that was brought up by uh, Secretary Simon, that when this was originally became part of Minnesota law, there were only a few felony offenses in Minnesota criminal law, none of which carried probationary sentences. Um, so at the time, this wasn't an issue at all. When the, once they were released from their sentence, they were automatically restored in their right to vote. Um, our criminal law has changed substantially, but for those who are originalists in their approach to constitutionalism, um, uh, that would be a, a valuable uh, point to consider. And the other thing that I've found particularly poignant is the fact that the American Revolution was in part, in large part, <coughs> fought over the concept of taxation without representation. Uh, yet felons who are released into the community are paying property taxes, whether they're renting, because it's a portion of their rent, um, or whether they own. Um, they're paying sales taxes every time they purchase something, unless it's a tax-exempt item. Um, they are uh, paying income taxes uh, when they're employed. They're paying all of their taxes, paying all of their dues to be a part of the society, but do not have the right to vote on those who are representing them. Uh, so for me, that restoration um, is incomplete. The restoration to society is incomplete without the right to vote as well. Um, and again, before we go on to uh, committee discussion, there is one uh, kind of a house cleaning uh, question I'd like to bring up with uh, the chief author, Senator Champion. <clears throat> Council has uh, looked, uh, at looked at the at House, house file, file language um, and compared it to the Senate language, um, and there really is only one substantive difference, <clears throat> and that is on page 6 in section 8 in the appropriation section, um, where the House includes a sentence at the end of what is in the Senate file that says that this is a one-time appropriation only. Um, I've consulted with Senate counsel and with uh, Senate fiscal analysts, and the, the cons consensus seems to be that that is better language to include um, in the bill and also to make appropriate change um, in, the, uh, um, in the introductory section um, at the top of page one. Um, so I'd like to ask uh, Senator Champion if you have any uh, uh, opinion on that, um, and if so, to share it with us. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, for the question. I am in, in lockstep with the, the, the Chair's thoughts. It's okay from my vantage point for us to include that language. Mr. Backus, Senate Council. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, if that's the intent then, um, Technically, again, we're working off the House file 28, but we're using, for purposes of this, the Senate file in terms of the page and lines. So the amendment would be then on page 6, line 25, after the period, insert this is a one-time appropriation period. And then on the title on page 1, line 4, after the first semicolon, insert appropriating money semicolon. All right, is there any uh, comment or discussion regarding uh, that proposal from members of the committee? I'm not seeing any. All right, Senator Umu Verbaten uh, uh, moves the adoption of that amendment as described by council. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails, the amendment is adopted. Um, all right, let's open up the uh, conversation now with the committee. Uh, anyone have any comments? Uh, Senator Westland. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you so much, Senator Champion, for bringing this bill forward. Um, I probably have more comments than questions, but I may have a question in here somewhere. As many people may have seen, there's a documentary called 13th, which outlines in great deal detail um, the problem of mass incarceration in the United States and the overwhelming impact that this has had, particularly on the black community. It began in the 1970s with the war on drugs and John Ehrlichman himself admitted that this was a war on black people. And what we have seen since the 1970s is an increase in our prison population in this country to the point where one out of every four prisoners in the world are incarcerated in our jails. And while this bill 
as described by Senator Champion and others, that the majority of people who will be impacted and have their rights to vote restored are in fact um, people of European descent. What we know, however, is that this has impacted black communities in far greater proportion to the numbers in, our, uh, in, in the population. I also happened to stumble upon uh, a report overview of drugs and prison in Minnesota, which was um, a presentation to the prison population task force on which uh, Senator Latz served. And the information there shows that there's been a 13, this was in 2015, a 13-fold rise in drug imprisonment over a 30-year, 33-year period of time. So we know that there's a connection between prison population, drug crimes from primarily possession. And what we know is that the folks in our prisons are people who have experienced high rates of adverse childhood experiences, toxic stress things that impact neurodevelopment of children. We have communal trauma, generational trauma, all of which impact communities of color in a significant way. As a person who's been in recovery for almost 24 years, I would also like to tell folks you cannot imprison our way out of drug addiction and alcohol addiction. The objective after a person has been incarcerated must be, should be, to help bring them back into our community, back into the social contract, and the only way we can do that is by removing the barriers for people to come back to us. And that includes social supports, that includes the ability to have a job, to earn a living, to raise a family, to have access to health care, to have the ability to be part of the community. And we have heard today from testifiers talking about the work they are doing with formerly incarcerated people to ensure that they come back into our society, that they are successful, and that they don't reoffend. That should be our objective. And withholding the right to vote does not support that objective. I'm a fan of Broadway musicals. One of my favorite musicals is Les Miserables, which is the story of redemption. It is the story of someone who was unjustly imprisoned, who came out and at a crossroads in a moment of kindness and compassion and love. Jean Valjean's life was changed completely and he spent his life then <coughs> repaying that debt by becoming a good person by changing the lives of others, by living a life of love and compassion. When we love people, we bring them back into community. I support this bill. It is the right thing to do. And Senator Champion and all of the folks who came to testify and all of the people who are here today in support of this, my heart is with you. I support this. And I hope that this committee passes this and then sends it to the floor where we make this the law of our state. Thank you. Senator Limmer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Good morning. Senator Champion. Good morning. Um, before I begin, I wanted to uh, recognize all of the people that have nonprofit organizations or ministries that deal with people that are in prison and who are trying to make their path straight. Uh, that is noble work, and I think we all should recognize that. Um, regarding the, the legislation, I think it's important to get a brief history of why Minnesota is the way it is when it comes to uh, Pen <clears throat> penalties for criminal behavior. Um, 
many people know that Minnesota ranks lowest, one of the lowest states to incarcerate people. About 45 years ago, the state recognized that a great deal of people do not deserve prison, uh, but oftentimes they deserve treatment for that opportunity for treatment or something less than incarceration. And so um, 45 years ago, they went on the path to uh, rely more on probation than a prison sentence. It's cheaper, it's more effective for some, and prisons were relegated to those who were the most violent and the most serious threat to innocent citizens. That's why in Minnesota, we sometimes have a little bit longer probation because it's taking the place of prison. Um, just a few short years ago, about one and a half to two years ago, the Minnesota Sentencing Guidelines Commission um, made a decision to limit probation, uh, cap it at five years for almost every penalty in our, in our uh, criminal chapter. Um, there is an exception for murder and there's an exception for rape. But other than that, uh, I don't believe any probation will last more than five years. Now that was about one and a half, two years ago. So in about three years, there's a great many people that will be restored their civil right to vote uh, at the end of that time period. This bill kind of uh, pushes that timetable up a little bit. Uh, almost immediate upon enactment. The uh, question of probation, uh, sometimes it's important because words are important. Uh, what is the definition of probation? What do you think of when you hear that word probation? You're on probation, young man. Um, I looked it up in the dictionary this morning uh, the definition that I read was the process or period of testing or observing the character or ability, abilities of a person in a certain role. It's a time frame, a period of time, where uh, we examine the behavior of someone in order to prove that they are worthy of going to the next step and I think that's important to have. Probation is an important role, especially in Minnesota when we don't rely on incarceration as much as other states. Uh, we do have the restriction of certain civil rights uh, while in that, until that sentence is fully commuted, meaning in the present tense now, you do not get your uh, civil rights restored until after that full time period, incarceration plus um, probation. But I would contend that the very first day of your probation period does not restore your virtue. We haven't seen whether or not that individual is ready for that full engagement of citizenship. And probation itself is a testing time. Uh, in this regard, I believe it disregards that testing period. And that's why I have difficulty with this bill. Um, I, you know, you have probation officers that are supposed to track and follow uh, the success of those that are on probation. Uh, a lot of times it's how they engage how they find a place to reside, and I know that's difficult for some. Uh, getting a job is difficult, and uh, probation officers commonly are trying to do that. Uh, by the way, I, I too have background in corrections, and um, there are some inmates that are released on probation that I have to honestly, I honestly shudder at what may happen with their decisions after they get out of prison, regardless of whether they're on probation or not. That's, uh, that's unfortunate. 
and um, but it's real. There are some people that uh, don't learn as quickly as others, and some don't even learn at all. They continue down that path. Um, I haven't been convinced that giving someone a voting right uh, after, without being fully tested will give me that guarantee that they're ready to make that decision to engage. Um, and that's why I have a real hesitation to move forward on this bill. And um, uh, Senator Champion, um, how would you ally my, my concern? Uh, a person on their first day of probation, uh, no one knows if they've restored internally their virtue to engage as a, a, a healthy uh, person ready to engage in full citizenship. <laughs> Um, Mr. Chair, Senator Champion, uh, Senator Limmer. Well, let me just say, Senator Limmer, uh, thank you for sharing your thoughts. But let me uh, tell you why there's already a built-in um, support or guardrails around your thoughts. First of all, when it comes to sentencing and disposition, the first thing the court looks at when you are interviewed for a PSI, that is a pre-sentence investigation, they look at your amenability. They want to see if you're amenable to probation. Have you followed the court's orders? They also look at the offense. What is it? If it's something that deals with a victim, they get victim impact. All those things are there. They even go through your, your, your family history. They look at your mental health. They look at uh, whether you are chemically dependent. There's a number of things that they look at in order to determine if you should be in the community or not. So that testing that you refer to, you are tested. And here's the other thing. Your probation officer makes sure that you do the things the court has ordered for you to do. And if you fail to do those things, they can file a probation violation and you can end up paying a consequence for it. And if you really think about it, when they're going through the analysis to determine what the sentencing should be and what the consequences should be, they even go as far as to look at your education and whether there should be cognitive skills. And as I mentioned earlier, treatment. So there are those guardrails. Uh, and I would also go as far as to say that when you're on probation, you're constantly being tested. And, and, and there is always this mechanism in order to make sure that you, you remain law-abiding. In fact, Senator Limmer, if you, cre if you commit a new crime while you're on probation, you are penalized for that because it says that you are on probation at the time and you have other enhanceable points that they can give you because of that. So, so Senator, your concerns uh, have all been addressed in real time. But let me also say this. When a person on day one is sentenced to probation, that is because there's been a number of things that have been looked at. When a person remains on probation and in the community because there's a continuation of a number of things that's been looked at. And every probation officer, like every court, wants you to do pro-social activities. They want you to do things that solidifies your support in the community and your connection to your family. In fact, they say, and I agree, that the more family support and community connections and your ties to your community, the more those things are real in your life, the better opportunity that you have at being successful. And Senator Limmer, you're right when you think in terms of, you know, uh, lowest for incarceration, although we will always, you know, deal with those things um, uh, around mass incarceration, which is another question. But let me also say that I'm reminded of some words that I believe she's your uh, constituent just talked about. How do we make sure that we in real time 
are looking at individuals and seeing their humanity and giving them the opportunity to continue to grow and evolve and learn. And just like the court, uh, when it makes a decision that someone should be in our community after doing this analysis, then we should do everything we can in order to welcome them back into our society as well. I'm reminded of the prodigal son. And I know that I'm not gonna go into a theological notion because we got too many uh, great uh, pastors around here that they probably would tell me that I'm off base anyway, you know, in my analysis. But, it, but, the, but the substance of it to me is giving someone a second chance. When you see that they have come to themselves and they come back home, then we should do everything we can do in order to open up our arms and say, welcome home. And I think that your um, issues that you raised, thank you again for raising those, but I do think that the testing notion is continuous, but it's already been done even before a judge makes a decision because there's a, a lot of information that is shared in order for a court to conclude that a person should be in our community. Senator Lemmer. Thank you. Um, Senator Champion, I'm a little confused by your use of the example of PSIs, pre-sentence investigations. Pre-sentencing, not probation. That's pre-sentence investigation aids a judge in tailoring uh, the sanction when one is found guilty of a crime. It assists the court to tailor it to that individual. Um, I'm not quite sure if that applies uh, at the point of the decision to offer probation to someone. Mm -hmm. But this is really uh, not even at that point of the discussion. This is after probation has been granted and that individual is now facing whether uh, they can vote or not. And so, um, uh, you know, I, I uh, tremble at the fact of going down the path of uh, the prodigal son myself. But uh, the one thing that preceded redemption of the father was repentance of the son. And, uh, you know, just to add a comment, I know that Senator Newman was referenced here as being someone that may have been supportive of the bill a few years ago, but he offered amendments. Um, wanting to vote for the bill, but he wanted to add a few things. He uh, raised amendments to um, recognize that the, the uh, wrongdoer was sympathetic to the victim. He wanted perhaps an apology to the victim. That was rejected by the majority at that time, majority voters. Um, in the Senate. He um, thought that perhaps payment of restitution should be uh, complete before restoration. It would give society an indication that this person was sorrowful for their actions and that they were ready to engage in a broader involvement of voting for their, in their society. All of those were rejected at that time. And quite honestly, I don't remember if Senator Newman supported the final version of the bill without those provisions, but I know he sought them. Um, and uh, because of that, uh, he was disappointed in that product in the legislature a few years ago. Um, so again, um, you have an individual that has victimized an innocent citizen in our community. Uh, they've had a uh, less of an incarceration sentence as compared to other states. He's now entering into a probation period. And yet, going back to that definition of probation, the process or period of testing or observing the character of that individual in a certain time period has not yet begun. So I don't know how we can determine the sincerity of that individual, which, which questions whether or not we should give them uh, the opportunity to vote 
on, on societal questions and candidates. Uh, Mr. Chair? Senator Champion. Uh, Senator Limmer, uh, I don't quite know how to be any clearer because a pre-sentence investigation happens before a person is sentenced, so there's already been some adjudication as to admission or finding by a jury of someone's guilt. So it, it is after that point and before the court sentenced someone that that is a tool that is used by the court in order to get a chance to look at the person, which includes all the things that I'm talking about when it comes to remorse, amenability, any victim impact, any of those things, any and all those things. What their mental health status has been, all those things are put in that document so the court has a really good sense of who that person is that's standing in front of them. And even on that day, a victim in your, in your scenario, because not every situation is that way, but I'm going to, um, that, that not every situation involves a victim, um, as you traditionally you know, say it. Um, but the bottom line is that the court has a really good sense as to who's standing in front of them. There was and is a testing. Even before you get to probation, it is a testing because the court wants to make certain that you are deserving of the right to have a probationary sentence. So there is a testing. Does that testing continue? Yes, because the, if there's a court order, the court wants to make sure that person does what they need to do. But the court also says that when you're involved in pro-social activities and if you're in our community, we know that if you do these things and you're tied to our community, chances of you reoffending or doing some other things will be decreased. So, Senator, I believe that your concerns have, well, have been addressed in my analogy, even with the PSI. Um, as it pertains to what Senator Newman had some concerns around, one of the questions around you know, waiting until the payment of restitution, then what you end up doing is victimizing poor people. Because if I have money, and if I can say, oh, I can pay right now, then what you're saying in a real way is the person who has m money, who has the ability to pay right now, now they can vote. While a person who's struggling on, um, struggling financially, they have to wait because they haven't, totally paid for restitution. The whole idea is to put people on an equal playing field. You also said that it's your remorse. I already said that the PSI and other things, and even in front of the court, the court is going to look at that, and, and that is already going to be determined along with repentance. And you also look at one's criminal history. So you look at if there is a, a consistent pattern of something, and that is something that is used by the sentencing guidelines and other things and judges to determine if someone should be incarcerated or not. But here's the thing. Every person deserves an opportunity for a second chance. And the more that we can do in order to create that environment and that opportunity, the better not only the individual becomes in their family, in their community, but we as a general society. So thank you, uh, Senator Limmer. I would hope that we can get some support from you uh, because we also do believe that a bright line is important because I know one of the things that have sometimes suggested that we carve out uh, certain offenses and say, hey, if you are you know, whatever, you can fill in the, um, the blank, then you shouldn't be able to vote. I've talked to many different people, including but not limited to uh, the County Attorneys Association, others that says that that's a bad idea because, it, because you need a bright line so people are really clear and that you, 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 you want to limit uh, the risk, uh, risk of confusion. So thank you, Senator Limmer. Senator Westland. I'll be brief, says every attorney. Um, 
But I, I just, can enforce it. So. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> I will be brief. Mr. Chair and Senator Champion, I, I have a quick question because I think this gets lost in all the words. Um, if someone has their right to vote restored and they reoffend, are they going to be subject to losing their right to vote again? Mr. Chair, Senator Champion. Uh, Senator West, Westland, yes, if they go to prison. If they go to prison, they lose their right to vote. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Champion. Uh, and I will simply say this. Senator I do Westland. not have the capacity personally to determine whether or not someone's sincere. I do not have the capacity to read someone's mind or their heart to see if they've engaged in repentance. But we have to give people the chance. You, you can't preclude the chance before we give them that opportunity. And if someone reoffends and they go back to prison, they will lose their right to vote again. It's very simple. Senator Kroon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I um, heard a lot of comments from testi testifiers, um, something to the effect of, you know, these people have paid their debt to society, um, so their voting rights should be restored. And, I actually agree with that, and I think the vast majority of people do. I guess uh, what I'm struggling with here is, I guess, my, my view on that has been your debt isn't paid until you've completed your probation. So I guess in my mind, how I'm looking at this is the question facing me is whether voting rights should be restored before you've completely paid your debt. And that's how I'm looking at it. Maybe the answer to that question is yes, and maybe it's no. That's, that's how I'm framing the question in my own mind. So with that, I, I did have some questions for uh, the Secretary of State. I see he's not here any longer, but um, maybe I'll pose them to the chief author then um, of the bill, and we can, we can go through them. But um, Mr. Simon said unequivocally and emphati emphatically, we know that allowing those on probation to vote reduces recidivism. And, um, my ears always peek up when um, a politician says, we know something, which I guess would include me, and I don't know that. So, um, and I didn't see any studies in the packet. Maybe I missed them, but I didn't see anything in there. So I guess my question that I would have asked to the Secretary of State that I'll pose to you, Senator Champion, is um, do you know who conducted these studies, whether they were peer reviewed, and how much they claim that recidivism was reduced by restoring voting rights. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Senator Champion. Senator, um, so um, I don't have any direct studies in front of me right at this moment, but we'll ha be happy to provide that to you. But studies suggest, and courts quote, and I agree with this, is that when kids as well as adults are involved in pro-social activities, that it, that, that it benefits not just them, but us, right? Because recidivism goes down, uh, their, their quick desire to get into something that isn't a good decision. So we'll make sure that you get that information as well. But let's also be clear about this statement, of, this statement around debt to society. The notion, uh, usually when you think in terms of sentencing, it is usually directly connected to the offense. There's usually a nexus between your behavior and consequence. It is only in this context that we say it doesn't have to involve voting, but we're going to take away this fundamental right to democracy, which is for you to be able to speak through your vote. And so um, one will still remain on probation, just like we uh, sometimes uh, want people to uh, make sure that they are doing only prescribed medication, even if you're of age and you want to have a drink or something of that particular nature. But it's usually connected to your behavior, something that you've done. And so I believe, and I hope that you would subscribe to, is that one's right to vote uh, should not be taken away just because we have the right to take someone's right to vote away and there being no nexus between the, their infraction or offense and the uh, consequence that we are asking them to pay. Senator Cron. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And to the point about the nexus, um, and I know that you were frowning upon carving out 
certain exceptions um, to make it more complex. Um, but to the point about the nexus, what, what, would there be anything wrong with carving out an exception for those individuals that um, were in jail um, on felony election fraud charges? Well, uh, Mr. Senator Chair, Champion. Um, I think that, that that would be a totally different situation, but we usually don't have that problem, right? We are usually trying to get people to vote, not stop them from, from voting. M most people don't go in and say, I'm going to pretend to be someone else because I'm going to vote, right? And so, um, again, uh, if they did something that is so egregious, then the court would certainly um, would certainly uh, put them in, in jail. But also, let me go this far as far as to say this, with all due respect. If a person is, you know, stopped for a DWI, whether that's a misdemeanor level or some other level, we don't stop them from driving. We will uh, not stop them from doing those things. We try to make sure that they're uh, not driving while impaired or those sort of things. Uh, again, there's a nexus between the infraction and, and the sentencing. So in this particular case, if they are incarcerated, uh, then they would lose that right to vote. But we haven't had situations where individuals are going in fraudulently saying that they should vote. Um, um, and, and I recognize that a part of the confusion has been if you're on administrative probation and you're in the community and you think, I'm good. No, no one's saying anything to me from probation. I'm OK. Very few people, but there has been confusion as to whether that person is still on probation and should have the right to vote. Not to mention that there are a number of different people who, who, who are no longer on paper, and they say, because I'm a, a, a felon, I can't ever vote. That is the sort of confusion that is happening in the marketplace. And I think and believe that a bright line uh, will clearly make sure that this confusion is dissipated. I just want to clarify one point. The term jail or incarceration and prison have been used interchangeably, but the language in the bill is incarceration. So that would apply to local jail as well as state prison. Um, and whether it's a technical violation of probation or whether it's a, a reoffense and a new sentence. Senator Cruin. Thank you, Mr. Choi, Mr. Chair. A point taken on that. Um, my point was I do think in my example there is a, a nexus um, and that could be worthy of a car vote despite your overall um, belief that there you know, shouldn't be car votes. That one I do believe there's a direct nexus and something we should consider. Um, my understanding is that there is a, a separate bill working the way through the system that um, would allow a voter to become a permanent absentee voter, so to speak. And my, this would really be maybe a question for the secretary, but I'm just wondering what would happen if, uh, if somebody whose voting rights are restored under this act did sign up to be a permanent absentee voter and then they reoffend and go back to prison, how the secretary might handle that situation going forward. Uh, if you care to comment or no, feel free. But I guess that question might be more so, better directed to the secretary. So, Mr. Chair Senator and, and Senator, that is something to talk to the secretary about. But I could just use my logic in saying that the, the, secretary, the secretary of State's office always prepares a roster when it comes to if someone is incarcerated or, or, or something of that nature. So if a person is incarcerated, that means that they can't vote, whether they um, are a permanent absentee uh, a voter, and I don't know how you become a permanent absentee voter. I don't even, I don't even think that's possible. Um, so, but the whole idea is we want to make sure that people who are not incarcerated and are living, functioning, thriving in our communities should have the right to make decisions about their future and the future of their children. Senator Carlson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Mr. President, I have some questions, and uh, they're going to lead to a conclusion that uh, I need to have cleared up in my mind. Uh, the first one is, uh, what is the crime and resolution for a felon 
who votes or attempts to vote while on paper. And well, what is the, uh, and actually connected with that is, is that violation simply a parole violation or is it a new felony? Uh, uh, Mr. Chapter. Chair and, and Senator Carlson, that would be a, a, a new offense. <clears throat> a new Senator Carlson. A new, uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair and, and Mr. President, a new fel a felony level offense. That's correct. And, uh, and Mr. Chair, that so that would would that require a a charge and a trial for that felonious offense? They would have an app, uh, Mr. Chair. Chair. Uh, so for any offense, a, a, a defendant is entitled to a trial, whether that is a misdemeanor level, gross misdemeanor level, or a a felony level. They would be in, entitled to a trial, and if, the state would have the burden to prove them guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Mm -hmm. Senator Carlson. And, and Mr. Chair, that, that is often uh, found to be, after investigation, to be a, um, a confusion where they didn't intend to vote. So once uh, that's found that it's not an intention, then it's no longer a felony. Is that correct, Mr. Chair? Senator Champion, counsel can help clarify yes, some of this. please. Mr. Backus. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, yeah, the violation of 201 point one. Uh, 014, the eligibility vote, is a felony and it has to require a person who votes, who knowingly votes, I'm sorry, who votes who knowingly is not, el knowingly is not eligible to vote. And thank you, Council. And Mr. Chair and uh, uh, President Champion, uh, uh, is that a frequent occurrence? Uh, from my looking at the violations that mm -hmm. I've seen, uh, that's often the offense is uh, an unintended offense. And so what it does is it requires the investigation, it requires the determination whether it's intentional or not, and then perhaps a trial, perhaps uh, it uh, reaches to the uh, a felony conviction and the person is now a, a new felon, I mean an additional felon, and so they, they lose all of the rights that they have had uh, when they got uh, uh, released. So there's, there's a, it seems to me there's a kind of a clog there where we're, uh, um, we're charging people with some level of crime that needs to be, uh, a remedy needs to be found. And there's a lot of uh, record of that, that, uh, that we are charging people, we are putting them through an, an additional trial and then some of them go back to prison, some of them may be uh, a lower level offense, and they, they don't get convicted of a new felony. Am I correct in that? So, uh, Mr. Senator Chair, Champion. And, and Senator Carlson, I don't want us to get derailed on, on what we are talking about here. We're talking about a person being a felon and on probation, and, and if they're in our community whether they should be able to vote. If a person, uh, if there's a new crime and if it's charged and punishable, then the judge would have to determine what the consequence should be. And so uh, it's my understanding that rarely ever happens, but, but there is, during an investigation, uh, there is a forward-looking uh, notion around whether it was intentional, what happened, all those sort of things. And I don't want to get derailed into another conversation about that other than understanding that if we have people, individuals living in our community, then we can deal with that. And if there is uh, some infraction, there will be the, uh, the appropriate consequence for their behavior. Is there any final discussion from members yeah. of the committee regarding uh, this bill? Yeah. Mr. Chair. Last comment, Senator Carlson. Okay. We, we have a long I, agenda today. I mentioned that uh, I'm leading to a conclusion here, and that, that conclusion is that uh, if, uh, if uh, Mr. President, if I don't want you to vote, if I want to extend your incarceration, I want to extend your inability to vote, then I would even add this uh, crime of attempting to register to vote uh, I would add that into law so that we would have an easy way to charge you with additional uh, charges and actually increase the length of time that you can't vote. And that 
could be looked upon as being a, uh, a, what, a, a demographic uh, issue, a, a voter suppression issue. There's all sorts of things there that seem to me to be, uh, um, let's say, in this instance, a, uh, a, a, uh, an intentional uh, method to keep you from voting. And I, I guess that's one of the reasons why I'm strongly in favor of this is that we've had a lot of crimes that have been charged, but we also have a lot of people that tend to be uh, uh, prevented from voting. And so this, you know, I think I'm strongly supporting this because it wipes out a lot of those crimes. It wipes out a lot of that, that discrimination against people. And I think that we, it's time we, we do something about that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Lemmer. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Uh, I appreciate your time constraints. Just have two technical questions. Um, Sir Champion, um, in our uh, sentencing options, occasionally the state of Minnesota offers a work release uh, program where a person who is formally incarcerated will uh, go to their job uh, during the day hours and yet they have to return to a uh, incarceration facility to spend the night. Uh, where does an individual fit in this? Are they fully in probation at that time, or are they not? Mr. Chair, Senator, uh, uh, Senator Lemmer, they are incarcerated if they're under the auspices of the Department of Correction in some program like that where they're just going out for the day and working and coming back. Okay. And, Mr. Chairman, one other question. Um, some of our uh, sentences for certain crimes, um, uh, especially those around sexual assault or sexual assault involving children, um, are recognized once a person gets out of incarceration, they are restricted from being near schools or churches where children would normally be. Um, at the same time, we have uh, polling places that are in uh, public schools during the school year and, or an occasional church when there's no other public building available. So um, how, does, how does that fit into your bill? Will that person uh, not be allowed to vote uh, in a public school? Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Chair. Lemmer, there's a couple ways that that can be approached. One is, is uh, sometimes if a probation officer knows that, they can require the person to be with a, an adult or because we have early voting now and that happens outside of a school, it happens in, uh, in, in, in other places or spaces, there is always an option for that person to vote without violating the terms of their probation. Thank you. Right. Seeing no... Further discussion on this matter, uh, Senator, uh, we'll move verbatim. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I will be moving the bill. I just wanted to express uh, my gratitude to you, Senator Champion, for your work on this, uh, as well as you, Mr. Mr. Chair Latz, and all of the testimony that we heard today. Thank you to the students from the Power People Institute for being here with us. This is why I came to the Senate, and I'm um, emotional about it. This is why I wanted to serve on this committee, and this is going to improve so many people's lives. It's, it's why we do this work, um, and I thank you for um, including me, in, and, and I'm honored to be a co-author of this bill. And with that, I move House File 28 as amended to be recommended to pass and be re-referred to the Finance Committee. Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion prevails. Uh, members, we're going to take a recess for five minutes. If you didn't hear, we are in recess for five minutes. Please be prepared to start again in five minutes. Thank you. Now you can clap. Now you can clap. Now, now you can applaud.
If you do not, please go ahead and carry your conversations into the hallway outside of the room. That's Thank you very much. <laughs> Senate Judiciary Committee will come back to order. Okay. Next item on our agenda is uh, House File 4. Senate File 27, Senator Muhammad, uh, relating to non-compliant driver's licenses in Minnesota. Okay. Uh, Senator Muhammad, welcome to the Judiciary Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this will soon become your favorite committee to appear in front of. Oh. <laughs> it already is. <laughs> Despite our reputation. <laughs> um, all right, uh, Senator Muhammad, why don't you uh, go ahead. We, are, we have we, before us House File 4. Um, so members in your packet, you should have the uh, most recent engrossment of House File 4, which was uh, sent over to us from the House and got referred directly to the uh, Judiciary Committee. Um, and uh, we'll take care of some technical stuff later, but first let's go ahead and ask Senator Muhammad to make your presentation. And I understand there are a couple of testifiers have, uh, have uh, signed up to uh, present as well. So, Senator Muhammad. Thank you. Good morning. And is this still morning? Yes. Good morning. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Chair Latz and members of the committee. Um, you should have in front of you a copy of House File 4. This is the version of driver's licenses for all, which passed in the House earlier this week. First and foremost, this legislation is focused on, drive, on improving public safety. Our roads will be safer when everyone has access to written and a driving test to make sure that they've shown the necessary skills in order to be able to drive. It will lead to fewer accidents and fewer hit and runs. It will lower insurance premiums for everyone. I'd like to take a note that this bill is supported by law enforcement, including the Chiefs of Police Association, MPPOA, and my office has also received letters of support from active duty law enforcement officials across the state of Minnesota. Members, these should be available in your packet today. In addition to being a public safety issue, this is also an economic issue. Our agriculture sector relies on the labor of undocumented Minnesotans who've been, who have a little to no access to public transportation in greater Minnesota. Business and farmers continue to deal with workforce sh shortages and this, bill will be, and this bill could help address those shortages by giving undocumented Minnesotans the driver's license that they need in order to get to and from work. For the undocumented Minnesotans who will be able to obtain a driver's license as a result of this bill, it's an issue of basic human dignity. How are you supposed to get to work, take your kids to school, or attend your place of worship without being, without being allowed to drive? The Coalition for Driver's Licenses for All has been asking us these questions for the last 20 years, and it is up to us to finally offer them a solution. I'm grateful to present this bill to the Judiciary Committee to discuss the data privacy provisions which are more clear and robust than those in the version of the bill presented in the Transportation Committee earlier. Thank you, Senator Latz, for the, com for the conversation to, that helped improve, that helped improve some of the, some of, that helped led to some of the improvements in this bill. The bill today contains an important amendment offered by Representative Scott which ensured continued data sharing between the Department of Public Safety, uh, between the Department of Public Safety and the Office of Secretary. This was, a good imp uh, this was a good amendment that improved the bill, and I'm grateful for the contribution. With these amendments, the, bill the, the data privacy provisions of the bill will accomplish these functions. Immigration documents and data will not be shared. Data provided to obtain or data provided to obtain or contained in a non-compliant compliant driver's licenses will not be shared with any federal agency that enforces civil immigration law without a judicial warrant. DPS will be able to continue to share other data with other local, state, and federal agencies and, and with third-party entities, but those entity, entities must certify that they will not share this data or this information with any federal agency that enforces civil immigration law without a judicial warrant. 
Additionally, these third parties must get the, inf the, get the same certification from their customers and there will be a penalty for any individual agency or entity that violates the limits on data sharing established in the bill. I believe these provisions strike an appropriate, an appropriate balance between protecting the privacy of Minnesotans while also ensuring ready access, ready, uh, while also ensuring ready access to necessary DPS information for law enforcement and other government agencies. Um, and I will turn over to my co-author and also somebody who's led on this issue for the last 10 years, um, if that's okay, Senator, uh, Chair Latt, Senator Bobby Joe Champion. Senator Champion, thank you. welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Long time no see, I haven't seen you in a while. <laughs> Let me say that I am excited to be here to talk about this important work and driver's license for all. And I'm so thankful and grateful for the work that's being done by Senator Muhammad. Uh, it is true that I've been working on this for quite some time. And when she um, came in and got elected, she instantly uh, said, hey, this is something I want to do. And I didn't want to stand in her way. And I looked for an opportunity for us to work together because we want to make sure that our folks have an opportunity to drive, go through the, the necessary paces so they can go to work and to their football games, uh, to the doctor's appointments, whatever they need to do without the threat of anything else occurring. So this is important work, and I won't hold you long. I want to just be here, and I'm going to help answer questions, uh, because this is something that Senator Muhammad and I decided we were going to do together. And we are true partners because this mission, this work is important for us. And I also want to thank uh, the folks who are here. And I know for me, Mariano and Giovanna, uh, uh, Javita, and all the others. And I'm sure there are other partners, too. I don't mean to leave any other partners out. But I know from day one, when I started working on this important issue, they were there. And uh, I just want to appreciate that as well. So thank you, Senator Muhammad, and thank you, Senator, Ch uh, uh, you, Chair Latz, for all your work on this as well, because you uh, did help me when I was doing it even back then. So thank you so much. Thank you, Senator Champion. I've been working on this since I was first elected to the House in 2003. Yes. <laughs> so it's a long, been a long road. All right. Uh, are you Vina? How do you pronounce your last name, ma'am? Iyer. Iyer. Welcome to the committee. Go ahead and state your full name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Vina Iyer. I am the executive director of the Immigrant Law Center of Minnesota. Excuse me, Mr. Chair. Senator Howe. Be before we get started, is yes. it possible to have them walk? For those of us that have seen the Senate File 4 and now we're at House File 4, is it possible that somebody can walk us through the changes from Senate File 4 to House file forward, so we're, we're more familiar with what we're looking at today. Yeah, uh, just so you know, it's a good point to make some housekeeping notes as well. We are going to recess from 1130 until 1230, so members have a chance to get some lunch. Um, we only have two testifiers that I'm aware of on this bill, and they'll both be fairly short. It's in my intention to do exactly what you've requested, so that I think before we break for lunch, we should all have a full understanding of what's in the proposal before us. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Iyer, go ahead. Thank you. Chair Latz, Lead Limmer, Lead Limmer is not there right now, uh, President Champion, Senator Muhammad, and committee members. I'm Vina Iyer. I'm the Executive Director of the Immigrant Law Center of Minnesota, which is a legal services organization with Minnesota offices in Austin, Moorhead, St. Paul, and Worthington. We are committed to supporting immigrants on the pathway to citizenship through education, representation, and advocacy. ILCM is proud to support HF4 SF27, the restoration of driver's licenses for all, and is privileged to testify today regarding the data privacy and protection provisions of the bill, which are critical in this age of data sharing and mining. The main data privacy provision of this bill adds a subdivision 11 to section 171.12 of Minnesota statutes. It prohibits the sharing of data and documents relating to immigration status, but creates an exception with sharing documents with the Secretary of State in order to ensure the accuracy of the voter rolls as was added through a amendment from Representative Scott in the House. Additionally, information cannot be shared for civil immigration purposes without a judicial warrant. 
In short, these provisions ensure that the routine act of applying for a driver's license does not open the door to deportation and family separation. We therefore urge this committee to vote in favor of the bill. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Iyer. I'm also informed that uh, Sergeant Sherry Falkowski is <coughs> present to give testimony. Is Sergeant Falkowski here? Come on forward, ma'am. Sergeant, go ahead and state your full name for the record and proceed. Hi, my name is Sherry Falkowski. I've worked in law enforcement for over 25 years, and I work for the St. Paul Police Department currently. But as we talked about earlier, that this bill is supported by Minnesota police officers. This bill makes Minnesota roads safer. It allows people who want to be compliant the ability to do so. We in law enforcement have seen accidents because people didn't understand the rules of the road. This bill allows people the opportunity to learn. It educates more drivers. In law enforcement, when we have a picture ID, it makes our interaction simpler and quicker. It eliminates the need for officers to handle other identification items, such as passports, and it creates less exposure to us and stress on the individual. Let's make Minnesota roads safer together and pass this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Sergeant. All right. I um, <clears throat> just want to call the members' attention to a number of letters that are in the committee packets as well from uh, individuals and organizations that are supporting uh, the bill. I'm not going to identify all of them uh, verbally here, but I'll note that the Minnesota Chiefs of Police Association is in here. Minnesota Police and Peace Officers Association is here. Minnesota Department of Public Safety Driver and Vehicle Services uh, Director, the Metro Transit Police Department, um, among others. So, and there, actually there are quite a few police departments with individual letters as well. Um, and uh, so I'll just call your attention uh, and uh, Scott County Sheriff's Office, for example. Uh, uh, so uh, you can uh, take a look at through those uh, uh, as uh, you wish, members. Uh, let's see if there's anything else. Uh, Hospitality Minnesota. Also, uh, their president and CEO, Liz Rammer, has submitted a letter um, uh, in support of this as well. Uh, so with that said, I'm going to ask uh, I'm going to make a preface remark, and then I'm going to ask counsel to walk us uh, through the bill. Um, Article 2, which is the data portion of the bill, is the one that is uh, within, uh, primarily within our jurisdiction. Um, it was amended substantially in the House um, after a uh, collaboration between Representative Scott, a number of immigration attorneys, um, and... Uh, I just want to make sure I make, yep. identify um, House Research, um, the uh, Minnesota Department of Public Safety, and the Secretary of State's office. So um, that was a, uh, um, a rewrite of Article 2, um, and that is in the language that we have before us as part of House File 4. Uh, so, uh, Council uh, Primo, why don't you go ahead and walk us through the bill? Mr. Chair and members, I will focus on the provisions that are within the jurisdiction of the Judiciary Committee. I will note um, that Article 1, um, which was heard in transportation, that is predominantly the same uh, in both the House file and the Senate file. As Chair Latt stated, the changes are really in Article 2. The first piece within the jurisdiction of our committee is Article 1, Section 9. This prohibits a state agency or political subdivision from using the possession of a non-compliant license or ID card as evidence of a person's citizenship or lawful presence or as a primary basis for investigation or detention. That Article 2 begins on page 10. All of Article 2 is within this committee's jurisdiction 
and this provides various data privacy classifications, protections, a certification process, and subjects um, certain entities to the penalties in Chapter 13. Section 1 is a conforming change to Chapter 13. Section 2 requires an independent audit of compliance with the certification requirement. The certification requirement is a piece from the House that was not included in the Senate file. Section 3 requires a certification of any disclosure of data that is um, currently authorized in, in current law. Moving to Section 4 on page 11, this provides some clarity that the current mandatory disclosure of personal information related to the operation of a motor vehicle or um, to public safety does not include the immigration status data that is classified um, in Section 7. Section 5, which is at the bottom of page 11, also prohibits the Secretary of State from further disseminating data on individuals related to non-compliant licenses and IDs except to administer elections or to update voter addresses. And this is um, a piece that the testifiers have mentioned um, came from the House as well and was not included in the Senate file. Section 6. Um, so section five is, is the, sorry, to section five on page 12 also includes a paragraph D that begins at line 11. And this is the piece that requires a certification that a person receiving the data will not use it for civil immigra immigration enfor enforcement purposes or disclose it to a state or federal entity that, um, for those purposes and subjects those entities um, subjects the data requester who violate, violates the certification to civil liability and criminal penalties, which are found at current law in Chapter 13. Section 6 provides some, some clarifying language that the current law um, disclosures do not include this immigration status data. And Section 7, which begins at the bottom of page 12, is really the main um, language that identifies and defines what the immigration status data is and also classifies it as private data on individuals and prohibits the dissemination of that data, except to and within the Department of Public Safety, the division, specifically to the division that administers driver licensing and to the Secretary of State for purposes of improving the accuracy of voter registration records. There are also a few other prov um, provisions um, clarifying and prohibiting that any sharing of this data except pursuant to a valid search warrant or a court order. And violations are subject to Chapter 13 penalties and provisions. And if there are any other questions, I am happy to answer them. Thank you. So members, uh, this bill uh, came to us from the House, but Senate file uh, 27 had gone through the Senate Transportation Committee and been re-referred to judiciary. There were two amendments that were added in the Senate Transportation Committee which are not in the House file. So it is uh, the desire of the Senate Transportation Committee Chair, Senator Dibble, and I understand that of the chief author of the bill, Senator Muhammad, that the changes added in the Senate Transportation Committee be honored and be added to the bill before us here today. And I understand Senator Howe has an amendment to accomplish that. Is that correct, Senator Howe? Yes, Mr. Chair. And Senator and Howe, you serve on both the Transportation Committee and, of course, here on Judiciary. So yes, Chair Latz, I do. Uh, I have that. Uh, Congratulations. That, that honor, yeah. Uh, so I, I, I thank you uh, to both uh, Senator Dibble, Chair Dibble, and, and Senator Mohammed to, that they were willing to, to allow us to insert these back into after they were agreed to. And actually, both amendments are included in the one amendment, the A1. Chair Latz. 
I'm so sorry, I would Senator, move the I'll, A1. Yeah, I was going to have you move it so we can actually distribute it to the members. And, all right, so while we're distributing it then, if there's anything further you'd like to address the content of the amendment, go ahead. The, the amendment basically, in, uh, it's on page three, and what it does is instead of to it in te a, attesting to it, it declares it under the penalty of perjury, the, the applicant. So it's on page three, line 17. And if I may. So it, it just makes it so, uh, instead of just attesting to it, make sure that they, they understand that it's, they're declaring this, that they're a, they're a resident under the penalty of perjury. So it just makes it clear that the applicant knows what they're, what they're doing there. And then the other piece is it doesn't allow them to issue a, it, it's kind of belt and suspenders stuff because you can't issue a, a commercial driver's license to someone that can't demonstrate citizenship or law, lawful permanent residency in the United States. So this just makes that clear to, to it's kind of belt and suspender. It's federal, federal law. We're just putting it in the state law so people fully understand that. So, Senator Muhammad, your position on the amendment? We adopt that amendment. Any questions or discussion uh, relating to the, uh, the A1 amendment? Not seeing any, Senator Howe moves the A1 amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, the motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. All right. To the bill, um, is there any committee discussion uh, relating to the bill? Uh, Mr. Chair, I, you know, I, I have some some concerns, uh, and I know that uh, I raised those in the Transportation Committee, but I'm going to, I'm just going to, I don't think uh, I'm going to, I've got some amendments that I'd like to offer, but I think I'll wait until after we come back, if that's appropriate. But I will, I will have, I would ask the, if I could ask Senator, if she will yield for a question, I would like to ask Senator Mohammed a, a couple of questions as we move forward here, if that would be appropriate. Sure, and Senator Howell, as a matter of just committee protocol, you don't need to request that they yield. You can just go ahead and direct your question to the chief author. Senator Howell. So, Senator Mohammed, uh, back in transportation, I asked you if you had read, read uh, you know, back in 2003 when this all occurred, uh, the Department of Tr Public Safety made, did, made the changes to our statute through rulemaking. And when they do that, they have to, st to submit a statement of needs and reasonableness, and so otherwise known as a sonar. So my question to you is, I asked you at that time if you had, you know, if to fully understand what we did back or what they did back then and make those changes, it's important for us to know why they made those changes. And I asked you if you had read that sonar. And I'll ask you here today, did you have, take the time to actually read that sonar to understand why they did what they did back in 2003. Senator Muhammad. Mr. Chair, Senator Howe, that's a good question. Um, I had a chance to take a look at it, but what I've been doing is actually talking to um, Senate Council. I've been speaking to um, attorneys who've worked on this for a number of years and people who've been affected by this issue um, to understand how uh, uh, revoking this right has, has affected their lives. Mr. Chair, follow up. Senator Howe. Thank you, Chair Latz. Well, and I'm going to I'm going to actually read part of these segments. And in, in page two of the sonar, it says the state's licenses are gateway documents for establishing a legitimate identity and ad obtaining privileges normally reserved for citizens or permanent residents of Minnesota and the U.S. With state at issued identifications, people can open bank accounts, obtain credit cards, gain entry to government buildings, and airports. And that is still current today. With a Minnesota license, people can obtain such privileges as state resident tuition reduction, health care, and other social service benefits, even resident hunting and fishing licenses. 
Nine, there's a number of states that once 9-11 happened, they all start, the 19 states decided to start changing and strengthening the driver's license requirements as they relate to residency, legal presidents, and short-term admission requirements because of the threat of what happened in 9-11. Actions taken, the states that issue licenses, and many of us are still working towards this, but the states, they issued licenses, and so did we, instantly over the counter, are considering eliminating that practice, and some already did so. That was back in 2003. In Pennsylvania, when they checked their driver's license, they found thousands of fraudulent social security numbers in the driver's license records. Since the national standard for identifications don't exist, they do exist now, but this will not meet those requirements. Licenses from other states aren't reliable proof of identity or legal presence. That and what this stated was Minnesota can't return to a policy where the state relies on license reciprocity. That's a good question. For, that's a good term for me to practice on, I guess. Uh, the reciprocity uh, among the jurisdictions of Canada and U.S. And we we still, unless you have a uh, a real ID or a how come I'm drawing a blank. Enhanced ID, that's, that's still current today. Members, the Federal Trade Commission reported that identity theft and fraud just in 2021 was 1.4 million. This bill actually relaxes the requirements and I believe that is going to substantially increase in our state because I believe, and I can't remember how many there were, uh, I'll have to look that up, but there were a number of identity thefts in our state last year. My own bank account was affected. So, I do believe that this is, this is important work. I believe that folks should be able to get a driver's license, but I think that residence requirement is paramount. Mm -hmm. And the proof of that residency requirement has to be stiffer than checking a box. Uh, and we, we heard in the Transportation Committee that we believed that, well, things are different now than they were 20 years ago. But we heard from DPS, they don't have a process in place. They're working on it, but they do not have a process in place to check foreign documents at this time. And I will say that in 2022, just last year, 98 individuals on the terrorist watch list were apprehended at our southern border. Do you believe we got them all? I do not. 19, those 19 terrorists that boarded our planes, boarded the planes and flew them into the, the the Trade Center had 30 driver's license, state issued driver's license and identification cards. I'm not opposed to giving driver's license out, but I do believe that our national security needs to be upheld. And I think that's paramount. Senator Muhammad or Senator Champion. Uh, Chair Lotz, Senator Ahau. Um, Senator Muhammad. Thank you. Um, thank you for reading that. I think that you and I, Senator Howe, can both agree that 
um, protecting our country and our democracy is utmost, one of the most important things to do as Americans, especially as people who serve the public. Um, and I agree with you on that. Um, when it comes to the issue of uh, folks uh, going to, uh, doing identity theft, going into people's bank accounts, people who are citizens and non-citizens both do that. We have citizens, U.S. citizens who do that, who commit crimes, and that is why we have laws in place to ensure that we're protecting people, especially citizens, to ensure that doesn't happen. What this bill does is it allows people the right to be able to drive their families to work, to school. It allows these people to get to work. They're paying taxes and fees in our state. And the one thing that you and I can, as public servants, can do for the people behind us is give them back a privilege that they've always had. We're not relaxing the laws. There are laws in place if they commit crimes to ensure that they're held accountable to the extent of the law, and I'm committed to doing that. But I'm also committed to ensuring that people in our state feel safe, feel heard, um, and feel like that they're part of a society that takes care of them. And that is why I ran for office. And I, I, I know you shared a story. Um, when we, you were in transportation that talked about the fact that you care about the immigrants in, that are your constituents, documented and undocumented. Um, and we have federal agencies that do national security and take and have laws in place to ensure that they're taking care of that. But we also have an obligation to take care of the people who are here, to give them the, the necessary things that they need to be able to take care of their loved ones. Senator Champion. Uh, just briefly, Mr. Chair, what I will say is uh, in, uh, from uh, 03 and today are different. Like, for an example, we do have real ID. We do have enhanced driver's license. That requires much more than just a, just a mere driver's license in order to make sure that we know who's getting on those planes and th th those sort of things. We just don't want to conflate those two issues because it, it is true that we have to make sure that the people behind us have an opportunity to drive, they go through the paces in order to demonstrate that and pay the fee. Um, and I'm sure that we can talk a little more, but I'm going to have to go to a, a bill signing. And so I hope that we can pick up where, where we left off after the break. Um, so one other thing I'll just uh, call the members' attention. Um, <clears throat> The Commissioner of Public Safety can suspend the driving privileges of someone who fraudulently uses um, a driver's license under Chapter 171.18 and can cancel it under 171.14. And also the Minnesota Driver and Vehicle Service Protocols requirements for getting a driver's license in Minnesota are far more robust than Pennsylvania had prior to 2001. Um, and uh, it includes multiple forms of identification. Even if you come in with an ID, an ID or a DL from another state, it's, it, they don't just look at that and issue a Minnesota driver's license. There are multiple primary and secondary identification documents that are required before they will issue a DL in Minnesota. Um, I w we can pick up this thread. Final thought, Senator Howe, before we go into recess. Thank you, so. Senator Latz and, and Senator Mohammed and Senator Champion. I hope uh, as we come back, and I, I share that, I hope that you'll take some of the, what I've got to, to offer, not to, to dissuade anything or prevent anyone, but maybe just to stiffen up a few things as we go forward, and hopefully the, the committee will look favorably on them. So we I will consider that. every amendment that's offered. Senator Howe, uh, we're going to recess until 1230. Members, please be back here and prepared to start again at 1230. The committee is now in recess.